a uh, data set from the National Renewable Energy Lab showing the different kilowatt hours per square meter per day um, resources that we have throughout the U.S. And this kind of gives you an idea that really we're not that far off from uh, any from Miami or Phoenix, which most people traditionally think are your best uh, spots. International Falls, Minnesota, really, again, 4.31 compared to 4.85 for central Illinois. Um, it's still very <laughs> viable, and, and you don't write it off. You just say, okay, we're not going to get as much energy per square meter, so we're going to increase the size of the array to make up for a little less resource. <clears throat> so it works out quite well. Irradiance affects energy production, and so <clears throat> just because it may be a little bit cloudy doesn't mean things stop working. They just don't work as well. So notice our top line, which is our standard uh, 1,000 watts per square meter, but if you drop down to 800, which is what we see on average, or 6 for 200 watts per square meter, you'll see a reduction in energy production, but you don't see it stop. Okay, so you still have energy production even on a cloudy day. Just a brief primer um, on how photovoltaic cells work. The photons in the sunlight uh, contain different amount of energy. When the photons strike a PV cell, um, they will excite excess or extra electrons, which will then start to move, go from one side of a cell to another. It's called a PNP junction. They coat the silicon wafers with chemicals to allow that to happen. Your electrons then pass on to a grid or a conductive surface. I'm not even going to get into voids right now. And then you have electricity. Now the electricity produced by solar modules are all DC current. When a solar module is manufactured, it is manufactured from cells. The cells are grown in ingots. They're either a square or round. Actually, they're all round cylinders. Some are trimmed in the squares. Some are left round. They are cut into slices. They are then treated uh, chemically. And then they are tested for output to see how they respond under varying light conditions they are then able to tell how much energy they are going to get off of these cells. These cells are then matched and laid in a, a, a very clean room type environment onto a polymer backing. They are um, interconnected and they are sealed then in a low iron tempered glass. And one of the main purposes why I like to show this slide is because there's so much hype out there right now on building your own solar panels. And when, when you look at the process that a commercial um, solar module manufacturer goes through to bring out a product with a 25-year warranty and a service life of 40 years, um, you cannot match that by building something in your in your garage. You will only get a fraction of the lifespan, a fraction of the energy output, and um, that's just how it works. What's very interesting about this is in Europe now, they have a very good um, industry on recycling solar module. They have been, the, the Europeans obviously are way ahead as usual, and they have modules now that are at the end of their service life, and so there is an industry that has sprung up to recycle components from modules. The uh, aluminum frame, the glass, the uh, plastics, they can actually extract the chemicals off the silicon, recycle the silicon. So there's a good portion of these modules that can be recycled. They're, they're not going to go into the dump. Based on the energy output of the modules, which again is DC current, and uh, we are then able to connect these modules in series and also connect them in parallel to reach a desired output um, that our inverter circuit will require. And I'm just going to cover some of the basics on the different type of modules that are out there. Uh, again, I talked about the, the round cells and square. All your cells are round. They will square them off at the factory. The advantage is that you have a little 
you have uh, the ability to squeeze more silicon per square foot than you can with a square than you can with a round. And if you just look at the spacing between uh, the uh, cells. And monocrystalline, which are just single crystals, have very good efficiency ratings. And I'm talking module efficiency, not individual cells, which I think is very misleading. But uh, uh, module efficiency is at 14 to 17 percent. Well, why is there space between the cells at all? I mean, you know, just even with the more compact configuration, you still have those little diamond-shaped spaces in between. That's just how they're they're manufactured. Yeah. Now the thin films, they have thin film modules, which I'll get into here, which they will actually use sheets of um, silicon and different um, material. You you won't have these uh, spaces. I'll, I'll show that to you here in a second. All right, polycrystalline, where they actually have chips that are integrated, as you can see from the reflection here, little chips, work. they work quite well. Their efficiency is not as good as monocrystalline. You'll see a 12 to 15% module efficiency. And again, notice now here, we don't have the individual cells. We, we don't have the spacing between. It's just a sheet. And then we have our thin films. And... Um, it didn't really, I've got a couple of these at my house, and this is where I, I got the photographs from. You can't, can't really see the little ripples in the, in the sheets real well, but they are actually sheets that are, in, in the case of this module, which is an evergreen module made in the, in the U.S., you can see a little bit of a ripple. Um, they, they do put the tracings on, except it's in a sheet, not necessarily in a cell. And so the, the lines you see are actually the conductive surface. Um, there are also flexible solar modules uh, manufactured um, by Unisolar, which are, are really nice. The one disadvantage to thin films is that their efficiencies are not as good as a polycrystalline or monocrystallines. On the other hand, they also are able to tolerate higher temperatures better. They won't have a degradation in output uh, that you see with a polycrystalline or monocrystalline. That being said, because of their lower efficiency, you also need more square feet in order to get a determined amount of um, kilowatts out of an array. But you see these now starting to show up on, uh, on backpacks and things of that nature, and there's even talk now where you can um, get a jacket that has a module built into the back of it and plug your iPod in and yada yada. Um, of course here, Debbie has um, her rolled uh, cells that are good for sheet metal roofs and things like that, standing seam roofs. So those work real well for that. Although with the code, that's the way they're changing the code, that's always a work in progress. Okay, I talked about how ambient temperature, we got into this earlier, how it affects energy production. And this is, um, this is a Sanyo 210-watt uh, module. And I wanted just to highlight how important it is when you start factoring in uh, various uh, design criteria, why ambient temperature is very important, and especially with the way the code, Na uh, National Electric Code, has been rewritten for 2011, it's even more important now when it comes to the logistics of wiring and conduit and things like that. As the module gets warmer, um, you will have an energy decrease. As it gets colder, you will have an energy increase. Modules are tested at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is a standard of testing, and we have that by the dark line here. So as an example, this module puts out, say, 52 volts at 77 degrees. At um, 165 degrees, uh, which is a very warm rooftop temperature, it can get into the mid-40s, so you'll have a decrease in energy production in fact, if it's hot enough, it may not even start the inverter up if it falls outside the operating window for that inverter. Um, at 32 degrees, it is going to be in the mid-50s, so you're looking at almost a 10 degree difference in voltage when, uh, where uh, in, in the wintertime you could actually cause an over-voltage condition which will cause magic smoke to come out of an inverter because you reach over-voltage. So, this is why system design is very important, and again, this is why um, thin films have an advantage in uh, higher ambient temperatures. Their energy 
drop is not as great as it would be for a crystalline module, but again, you, you do need, um, the, their efficiency is not as good, but for a high temperature environment, thin films are good. Um, I typically design systems for a minus 20, and um, if, you, if you do a system and, and you're subject to a, a building inspector, electrical inspector, they will want to see the calculations to make sure that you're meeting that criteria, that your system does not go over 600 volts at minus 20. And typically, um, what we do is depending on where we're working at in the state, which is actually kind of interesting because I, we're working on a system down near Edwardsville and they actually had minus 26 degrees two times over the last 20 years. So I thought I was going to be able to get him a little more um, numbers on paper, but in reality I had to factor him and I went for minus 22 uh, on him just to make sure that his equipment wouldn't um, fail and go up in smoke during the coldest winter day because it will happen. Well, shouldn't there be something to know that if the current the voltage is too high, you shut it off? You don't no, you, you don't want, you, you're not going to be there monitoring the voltage. You I know. You want so hands off. There's no automatic way of doing that? Um, Regulating the voltage of it? No. No, the inverters have a very specific voltage window. They uh -huh. will max out at 600, deg or 600 degrees, 600 volts. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I know one system design that, that we're actually going to start here in a couple of weeks. At minus 20 degrees, they're running at 530 volts. Now, there's no need to, to push it right to the limit because another thing, and I can't get certain people to recognize this fact, that when the wind blows in the wintertime, it'll make that overvoltage problem more acute because it will actually pull the heat off the module and you will see a spike in voltage. And I've watched this happen. And I've argued with a couple of the code guys at some seminars about this. I said, you know, you need to have maybe some sort of a quote unquote wind chill value maybe assigned to because uh, to to eliminate this from happening because a lot of people don't really understand that if they're placing a, a a module say on the ground especially it's not really much of an issue on the roof unless it's a flat roof and the modules are elevated but if you have the wind blowing out of the north in the winter time you're already running at 55 volts and say you, you get a nice 20 mile an hour breeze that crops up and that panel now is being super cooled as it were, the efficiency shoots up, now it's going into high voltage mode. And that's something that has to be factored. So I try to leave a little bit of headroom there to allow for that because it will. I've had actually my, my uh, electronics at the home have shut down um, because of over voltage because I've had high winds a couple of times in the winter. And that's uh, kind of a frustrating thing but in a direct grid tie environment, which I don't have it in my house, I run off grid. Um, your equipment is not protected from over voltage. They don't have that. It'll just go up and smoke. They're, you know, they're expecting you as the designer to make sure you do your, your number crunching right. So it's the inverter that gets damaged in that yeah, case? Yeah, it's the inverter that gets damaged, yeah. All right, now, that being said, this is something interesting that I discovered last week. Made by a company, Solimpex, Solar Energy Corporation. They have offices in Turkey and in Germany. This is a hybrid, solar, pho solar photovoltaic combined with solar hot water. The premise being that solar panels heat up, and if you combine a hot water system behind the solar panel to actually draw off that heat because heat goes to cold, you will increase the efficiency of that module mm. while supplying heat to warm up water. 